Welcome everybody to our session. Um, me interviewing Mari um, Belua at um, ten o'clock on this amazing, amazing session. How to take advantage of COVID nineteen to steer your startup to success. There's so much we could discuss. Um, I've not been following Mayor in the past, but I've been ever since I've gotten this opportunity. Um, we also had a, a, a brief call on Friday where we started, um, you know, learning a little bit more about each other and really, you know, paving the path for a great conversation for everybody listening in. So, Mayor, before we get started, if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about your story. Um, it's, it, you know, to put things in context, we, I always like the host to actually share a little bit about your past story. Everybody has a story. Everybody has a unique story and a very important in order to set the tone for our conversation. Sure. Um, so first off, thanks for, uh, thanks for hosting me. Uh, you're, you're officially the host right now, so I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, and getting connected to you. Um, but yeah, the story, I mean, I'm a Montreal boy, uh, you know, went into the nonprofit world for two and a half years in Toronto, um, decided to pursue entrepreneurship because it was my passion. Um, started off in technology running, you know, I joined a small technology firm. Um, and then we ended up getting into startups. We started an inventory management software called uh, Morpheus Commerce. My partner went off to uh, South, went back to South Africa. And then I, I launched Leverage IT, which was sort of like a digital agency of sorts where we um, uh, built software, websites, marketing. And over the course of time, started accumulating and getting stakes in a bunch of different startups. Um, first one was a competitor to Lululemon, an activewear company. Um, and I remember driving to Montreal, we were three people at the company and driving to Montreal, trying to get out orders while my wife drove. And I had my, uh, my order management software, just pushing out orders. Um, uh, the fun times of early stage startups. And, um, and so eventually started accumulating bits and pieces of a bunch of different startups. Uh, helping launch them and start them. Um, and now, you know, now I'm the CIO, uh, Chief Information Officer, co-founder of a, a publicly traded uh, startup um, called Enthusiast Gaming. I am the uh, founder of my digital agency called Leverage IT um, and, uh, and co-founder of a company called Curb and Go, which some of you in New York may, may, may be familiar with, and an advisor to a bunch of different other startups. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So I, I want to, I, you know, there's so many different directions we could go with this conversation and, and Mir Sashem, we will try to touch as much as we could in order to bring value to our listeners. Um, as a starting point, um, you went from, you know, being nonprofit, some startups to actually running your own agency. In the typical world, we see the opposite. We see people running the agency and, run, and then moving on to their own business or investing in startups. Share with me a little bit of that, that mindset at that time as you transitioned into a traditional agency. Yeah, I mean, I think I was in the nonprofit world and I, um, I, I really got such a, running a nonprofit, you literally are in every part of the business, finance, marketing, you know, money management, people, like you really are doing everything because you don't have money to hire half the people. You should be mm -hmm. hiring. So you're literally running a full gamut. You're, you're an entrepreneur in a certain way. And so um, I had such an amazing experience there and started realizing how, much, how, how you know, without all the money, how much technology can actually help me operate a, a business, a nonprofit. Um, and that's where I fell in love with technology and did everything from event management to accounting to uh, online payments, you name it. This is uh, 2008. Um, and then I, I said, you know, I think I was 28 at the time. Um, and my accountant was trying to tell me no, because I was getting a good salary. And he's like, don't. Um, and my partner said, um, I was making over $100,000 at the time. And my partner said, um, sorry, my, my accountant said, you're, you're crazy. Like, you know, you, you have a three month now guaranteed salary for, for a third of what you were going to make. What are you doing? And I said, if I don't do it now, I'm never gonna be able to do it in the future. Um, and so started the digital agency at that time to capitalize on some of that passion and experience that I had previously. And so through, through a few different experiences created, became this sort of like agency. It wasn't, you know, I became that startup type of agency where I got pieces of business, not because that was my strategy, 
It was simply people didn't want to pay me in full. And I said, okay, I'll take a piece. This sounds interesting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so I, I want to I, I want to get about I want to speak about that particular piece of it, um, and the reason is because obviously we have a large agency in in the, in, in Brooklyn, and we also have a lot of people on this um, you know on today's um, event where there are freelancers doing different things, and they're all struggling. You know the con the, con- the concept that people always say that I'm not getting enough money for the value I'm bringing to the table. Especially if you're speaking to maybe a startup, a founder, or somebody that's looking to get to the next level, and actually they're turning to you for that support, and you gave them this big idea, you gave them this great uh, platform, and all of a sudden they're running with it, and you never got really the value that you actually brought to the table. Um, how how at which point did you decide that this is a good business model to go after those startups and try to get some piece of the pie, as we call them, and also what you know people listening to this you know obviously they need to be caution 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 about what they do and how they invest and where do they put their eggs so to speak when those opportunities come uh, because a lot of people as a starting stage would say you know what i want i don't want to pay i want to take take some shares and to take some equity instead of paying you so to, uh, walk me through a little bit of the process of what and you know what was your mindset maybe it shifted throughout the years that our listeners could actually pay attention to. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely shifted. You know, in the beginning, it was just like, cool opportunity, I'm in. I, you know, yeah. it was like, yeah. I, I can tell you, it's like Enthusiast Gaming, the story that happened at Enthusiast was was that I had a, you know, a Jewish organization in, in Toronto called Adracha, an incredible organization that helps people, you know, figure their career and help them get on their feet, called me up when I was, I think, 30 years old, 30, you know, 31, I was two years into my agency. I really didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> to be honest with you. I had maybe five employees at the time. And they said, hey, can you mentor this this kid? And I said, I mean, I don't know much about business, but I'm happy to talk to people. And 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 in walked this this kid who was the same age as me. He wasn't a kid um, who was in, you know, he learned in the mirror till 29. And he's like, look, I got, he had a full time job, had a you know, um, this gaming blog in his basement, he had this gaming blog. He's like, Hey, should I, should I quit my job and focus on this? And I said, look, I don't know. I, I know nothing about gaming and I know very little about business. So I'm the wrong person to ask. All I know is that at a certain point I decided to follow my passion and it's starting. And I love every day of what I'm doing. And, you know, I said, if you, if you're really passionate about this, quit your job, call, call up your wife and go, um, and find and ask her how long can you last without income? And he calls me back literally within ten minutes. He's like, okay, I figured it out. I can last. I don't know for three months, six months. I forget exactly how many, what he said. <laughs> At that point, I was like, hey, maybe maybe you shouldn't listen to me. Uh-huh. And uh, and quit his job and started calling. He's still like, hey, I got this incredible meeting. Can you come? And meanwhile, I'm a little tiny agency, boring, you know, in a certain way, nothing too exciting. And he's like, can you come to the meeting? I'm like, hey, this sounds really cool. And so I joined him at a meeting. There's like 12 executives sitting there. It's big. Um, it was the X in Toronto. Torontonians know it as like the biggest fair in Toronto. And and this guy who quit his job literally two weeks ago is sitting at a table of a bunch of executives pitch, p- pitching them on on this great concept. And and it it so it wasn't. It was sort of like I'm in. Like this, I, you know, this is fun. It wasn't sort of like okay, this is a good opportunity. I'm gonna. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my due diligence, understand the founder, look at the industry and the sector. At that point, I was just like a cool cool idea. I'm in. Now, obviously, you know, five six years later, things have changed. When in that, I get a lot of people like, "Hey, partner with me." And it is a traditional VC type model where I want to you know understand who they are, who they are as a founder, what the idea is, what the market is, and go back to the first one. Really understand who they are as a founder. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, question: The question is um, for somebody freelancing or somebody that has a traditional agency. Um, at which point would you say the agency or the person running the agency is at a stage that they could afford that type of model? I, I think that that's a question for a lot of a lot of people that that have that sense of urgency. You know, I want to make more money. I want to invest in those ideas. Um, at which point, you know, are you going to be sucked into that? You know, because when you do that, it's not only about the services. You know, I've been involved in a lot of ventures outside of, of what we do as, as a company, as an agency. 
And sometimes, you know, you got to roll up your sleeves and you actually pushed in to do other stuff that you didn't imagine you do. You thought that partner has it all figured out and now you have your, uh, you know, sweat equity there. <laughs> and you say, wait a minute, you know, you're not, you know, and you're not keeping things together. So as you're growing an agency, you want to make sure that that's stable and you also want to make sure your money is stable. You also want to make sure that that you're putting the eggs in the proper basket without any holes what would you say to the person listening to our to to this talk now uh, you know how do they approach it at which point are they ready to jump into ideas like this yeah i mean i would say it's like what's your risk tolerance you know like at the end of the day it's it's like anything else like i i love new ventures to the point where i care less about money today and more about money in the future but more importantly i like doing things i really really enjoy or i like mm -hmm. ideas like i'm a I'm a, I'm a sucker for new ideas or for new, incredible, dynamic founders. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I don't think, I, I think for everyone, they need to under, you know, make a, a risk assessment just like they do on any investment, right? Are they doing, you know, high risk, early stage startup investments? Or are they doing low risk, you know, you know, put it into bonds? I don't, I, you know, um, so I think every, every agency should, but it's like, you know, when you have an investment portfolio, you should probably take some percentage of it and put it into high risk, right? Whether that's 10% or 5%, you can speak to an investment guy because I sure ain't. Hmm. Um, but maybe you should do that. Maybe it's 10% of your time or your available resources should be invested into maybe an early stage startup. Hmm. So I, I don't think there's a right answer. I think it's a self-assessment that every, every freelancer, you know, you got to put money on the table. Right. So you got to make sure you have enough income. Mm -hmm. um, but at a certain point, maybe 10 percent you can dedicate to, uh, to, to early stage startups. Uh -huh. uh, before we shift the conversation to startups, uh, which I want to dive in uh, um, with a lot of questions I have prepared. Um, that person that's actually interested in pursuing a model like that you would just discuss where you have an agency, you're offering creative services and you do want to get some sort of sweat equity. Um, you know, maybe you did it one way. Maybe there's other ways how you could actually share share for the, our listeners. What is the typical setup? Meaning to say, I know that some people will do sweat equity uh, without anything getting paid for any of the services. But now you have an agency, you have employees you need to pay. What is the typical model that you've seen working? How those deals are structured? Yeah, I, I know mean, there's no typical deal. Simple. <laughs> there's no deal, there's no deal. And it's also a very slippery slope. Like at the end yeah. of the day, you say, hey, I'm going to do stuff for you for free. At the end of the day, you need to put bread on your table. So when a guy is going to pay you 90 bucks and your sweat equity is paying you nothing and it, and the company isn't progressing as fast as you, like, like everyone wanted to be a $100 million startup yesterday, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a slippery slope because then you're going to be like, well, this is not paying me. This is paying me. And you're going to not, you're going to stop delivering. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. you know, and from my perspective, I think there should typically always be some cash on the table, right? Mm -hmm. the, meaning there's got to be some cash on the table or everyone's going to lose interest. Okay. Right? You can't work for free forever. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's three months, maybe it's six months, but you can't work for free forever. You need, you need, you know, people need to live. So um, it's like, and, and it's very similar to a lot of early stage startups where they pay the founder, right? The founder takes some of that early stage investment money. Now, I, I think in the startup world, they say that the founder should never take more than their lead engineer. Uh, I think like, to, I, don't, I don't know at what point that changes, but I've seen that and I've been on some, you know, I've been advising or on boards of some companies where you've seen that, where you've seen that pl play out. So I think, um, yeah, I think that always, you, you know, it depends on the scenario, but, you know, don't say, okay, I'm not, I'm not making income. I'm going to go give sweat equity because, you know, it doesn't work out if you're just like, hey, you know, I'll work for free. Uh, uh, so so I, I think there should be a, a medium ground. Okay, so so basically, you would say that um, the person, the you know, the agency, the prov service provider will go below market value for the for the for the for the actual payment, and then say, you know, what, the rest I'll take with sweat equity with you know an equity share. Uh, yeah, uh -huh. and I've had I've had that recently where you know a company couldn't pay their bills, like this, especially during COVID, mm -hmm. right? They couldn't pay their bills, and and. I liked what those guys were doing. They ran out of cash. And I said, okay, look, I'll convert the, the, the profit because it wasn't a, a share. And I liked the company. I didn't, didn't want to invest money in them, but let me convert that, that, that profit on agency rates, on typical agency rates. I'll take that difference and throw it into your company at a, 
at a discount to your next round, you know? Got it, got it, got it. Okay, let's talk startup. Uh, um, so I want to I wanna, I wanna dissect and try to, you know, move the conversation into multiple um, places if we have, you know, if time allows. But the first thing is, you know, I want to, I want to, bust that bubble or that myth that people think that every startup is successful and every startup is a is a is a rise like facebook and whatsapp um, or any of the other companies that make a huge exit um, in your opinion um first of all if you have some data that you could share with our with our audience like what, what is the percentage of startups that are actually successful or actually make it to a, a viable company in the future that would be helpful but also, um, just give us your raw take on startups in general, and then we'll dive in some some more uh, concrete uh, questions that I have on that. Raw take on startups. Wow, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> my raw take is, um, you, you know, when I look at startups or I look at the startups that I've partnered with or been involved with or co-founded, um, it's it's I look back at the successful ones, you know, and there's 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 certain debates in terms of you know, do you want the founder to come from money, right? Is that a good thing or a bad thing, right? You know, these are all like really good questions that I've experienced in terms of like, you know, sometimes you have a startup where the guy comes from tons of money mm -hmm. and then, you know, the next shiny object shows up, you know, this doesn't make enough money for him and the next shiny object shows up and he gives up and I've experienced that. Um, but it, in terms of startups, when I look back, it really comes down to the founder. It really comes down to that founder, um, not the product. I, I've been involved in companies with incredible products at incredible times, like right? hitting the right time, the right product, fundraise like crazy, but ultimately the founder just doesn't know how to deliver. And, and I can get into, you know, where, where, where I see those issues. But mm -hmm. for the most part, I would say when I look at startups um, and I evaluate or I take a look at successful ones, it's a lot comes down to the founder. And it's, it's, it's less, I would say it's less about their ability to fundraise and more about their hyper focus on a product, on de delivering the best product for their customers. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's, you know, in a nutshell, when I look back, that's how I look at, at, at startups. I look at the founders. Mm -hmm. Uh, which which obviously is all about leadership um, and leadership is about tough choices and leadership is about understanding am I going for the next the next feature or am I going to MVP which is minimum viable product and get it out there and get feedback from the real world and the same is with with fun with funding you know so many business owners uh, founders uh, of startups they went ahead and they had a great idea but they went out and and raised it you know enormous amount of money. And they recklessly use that money in a way that they found themselves just to continue, uh, you know, raising and raising and raising. So they're in the financing business more than actually building their company or more than building the product. No, a hundred percent. I was involved. One of the first companies I was involved with raised so much money. It was ridiculous. And the founder like never really knew the product. Like he didn't get it. He, he tried hiring people. The problem was because he didn't know the product, he didn't even know if they were doing a good job or not, right? Yeah. He was so into the fundraising and public speaking and 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 marketing. Like these founders get very involved in marketing. And mm -hmm. it, you know what it flows to? It flows to ego, I think, for the most part, yeah. right? It flows to these founders that just have, they, they care more about their perception in the outside world and care more about, you know, that article on BuzzFeed or wherever it is, or so, sorry, Crunchbase, not BuzzFeed. Uh, mm -hmm. Crunchbase or TechCrunch or in Canada, BetaKit, right? That article that says, oh, we raised $3 million or $5 million or $10 million. Then all their customers saying, amazing product, just build me this or just fix this, right? They're not in the customer support chats. They're not in, they're not analyzing over their, the UI and UX of their product. And, and that's where I've seen incredible, incredible businesses and incredible ideas and incredible money that fail. Mm -hmm. There's something that we discussed on Friday, which uh, I use almost on a regular basis, meaning to say I would say weekly in conversations with people uh, when they speak about ideas and businesses. Mm -hmm. And I always say not every business is an idea. Not every idea is a business, which means is that you could have a me too product, which is literally you're building a software, a startup, which there is other t 10 other companies that are doing similar. However, you figure it out a how to deliver it quicker, better, cheaper for your client, better UI, better UX, or added some, some value into that, that mix. 
And even if it's not this new invention, and all of a sudden you have a very successful, art, you know, SaaS company, versus people that are so stuck in their idea, not knowing is this idea something that somebody will pay for? How is it fitting into a business's technology that they are actually purchasing? And then, you know, sometimes you'll sit with those founders. And the second they see that you're not 100% aligned with what they want to do, they walk out of the meeting because they're literally, you know, you banging their head against the wall. They don't want to hear anything outside of what they are thinking about the product, which is a huge mistake because at the end of the day, you're in your bubble. You're doing it, uh, you know, whatever that passion, what led you to develop it. But guess what? You want to hear some outside criticism because you're going to be faced with a criticism every single day. Every day, somebody will want your product. And they'll go on Google and see 10 other companies that are doing similar to your product. They're going to be doing that same exact uh, concept, asking why you, there's already this, there's already that. Or how easy is it for Google to add that feature in two months and all of a sudden your whole business model will, you know, disappears. How many times have we seen that? People building a, a SaaS business model on something else or complementing something else and all of a sudden that that marketplace or whatever added that feature and all of a sudden the business is not here anymore, no? 100%. I think Stuart Butterfield, uh, the, the founder of Slack, yeah. didn't start off building a communication tool. He started off building a game and then he developed this internal tool for his team to communicate and he's like, whoa, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, startup, you hear it all the time, the, this word pivot, right? Yeah. But it's in reality, a lot of times, it may, sometimes there's small pivots. You try a marketplace and you need too much, mar too many marketing dollars. I could say Enthusiast Gaming pivoted at a certain point. We, we, we started uh, with part of the idea to build a, um, mm -hmm. a social network of, of sorts for gamers. We did that in 2016. We built it. And then we realized, oh my gosh, we're going to need so much money to get this off the ground. We had 300,000 um, uh, um, visitors or viewers on our, on, our, on, our, on our platform. We thought, okay, 300,000 is enough to get this off the ground. And we realized, no, you need millions of dollars in order to really get something flying. Or, or, you know, or, and so we focused on building distribution where today, you know, Enthusiast Gaming, um, you know, hits over 200 million a, a month, right? And it's the largest gaming property in North America. And we focused on distribution and now we can say, okay, now we can build a social network because now we have distribution. So we pivoted, you know, we went down a path and we, we said, Hey, you know, um, and I'll take, give all the credit to Manasha, not me, my co-founder, but um, we pivoted the business because, because things have changed and you realize, you know, that, that you realize that it's not going to, it's not going to work this way. You need too much money. Product's too difficult. The market's too hard to reach for any number of different reasons. You got to change. Right. And, and, and a lot of that comes down to, like you said, it's the advice that everyone gives, which is why, you know, a lot of startups, you hear this, the lean startup, the MVP model, proof of concept, right? MVP, minimum viable product. Mm -hmm. The idea is that get to market really, really, really fast, as cheap and as fast as possible without the best product so that you can get that feedback. You know, and a lot of people, Eric Ries in his book, The Lean Startup, talks about how, you know, everyone comes to you with their idea and they throw an NDA in your face, Right. Okay, here's my idea, an NDA in your face. I make you sign an NDA. And he says, I never write, sign NDAs because that means that people are scared to share the idea with others. And the only way you know if your idea is good is if you Probably. share it with hundreds of people to, to get their feedback. Very powerful. Yeah, and I always, I always say that, meaning to say that, um, just adding to what you just mentioned about the NDAs, that if you're so good at what you do, you're going to be the leader anyway. You know, what, what do you think? You have this vision, you have everything, and all of a sudden somebody will just hear about it and just overstep you and do it faster than you, better than you. So obviously something, something is wrong with where you stand with your business idea. You know, it's not only the idea, it's all about the execution. And guess what? If you can't execute it, let at least somebody else execute it. <laughs> let, 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 let the world be a better place by somebody, somebody coming up with that and executing it well. Uh, which brings me to, you know, speaking about pivoting, and I think this is very much important now with COVID-19, um, post-COVID, so to speak, and we'll get a little bit into just general business and post-COVID, but um, in SaaS in general, startups in, in, in particular, you know, we don't have that longevity that we had 20 years ago with the product, with the business, uh, just the market shifted. You know, think about it for a second, um, um, you know, 10 years ago, 
companies were building custom CRMs. Like this was the hottest product for software developers. Every smaller company had a custom CRM because they needed these 10 features that maybe the, 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 the traditional CRM available didn't have. Now there's a bunch of tools. I, I think they call it like the plumbing for technology where, you know, this speaks to that, that speaks to this. So we have Zapier and we have this like on different levels on different so softwares. What did it do? It opened up a huge opportunity for people to be able to you know I could use three systems. My marketing company, my marketing team could use that system. Operations could use this system. Sales could use the other system, but they're talking to each other versus building building something from scratch. So once upon a time, certain software said, I need to do everything myself. Everything has to be built in. Every feature, every piece of idea needs to be built into my software. And they got sucked into developing and developing and developing. And everything was built out only 50% or 60% versus let me do the following 10 things, but my system will do that perfectly, elegantly, to beautiful UI, UX versus doing everything. Now we By see. By the way, I think, I think that that is to, to everyone who's listening. I think that ha that happens to be an incredible business venture that everyone should start getting into, which is like automation engineers. You don't even need to be a developer. You just mm -hmm. have to understand technology, research all the different technologies, and put them together for companies. Understand their business process and start implementing across their 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 whether it's sales, whether no matter the business, there are tons of tools, and like you said, they all in connect. I think Mark Cuban, um, he just said that um, the, 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 the skill or the, the, um, the best business he would tell people to go into is uh, programming voice language capabilities. Like when you say something into Alexa, it can create this cause and effect. And automation, I think, to your point, makes it so easy for a small, tiny business to really execute without, like you said, spending tons of money on software. Yeah, and, and and I could just say for my own company, like once upon a time, a, let's say you had a sales organization uh, and then the founder or the sales manager figured out, okay, we're going to go with Salesforce. We're going to go with whatever um, SaaS uh, platform. And now you had people that just couldn't adapt. You know, they're used to the phone and the Excel file. I don't I don't want to be busy updating uh, 100 fields because I, I, I had a conversation with a lead. Once upon a time, you had those people and the, the data wasn't updated because those people weren't just updating the data. Um, now, let's I, I could say in my own company, I had a person that they loved Excel. They just couldn't go away from Excel on sales. They just want to have one spreadsheet and everything else. With Zapier and other and some other platform, other technology pieces, I said, you know, it's fine. You just update your Excel file. And I had my reporting coming from a different software but Zapier was just updating those, uh, updating those those fields based on what the, that person, that salesperson updated on their sheet. So you could actually allow people to be more efficient, more effective in the way they want to operate. Yes, you have to have procedures and processes to make sure that nothing falls through the crack. But we're, we're getting a little bit um, off track. But I think what you just mentioned for our listeners, A, is, yeah, this is a huge opportunity in, in the world. And also for the startups founders, understand that as you're building your platform, as you're building your software, right away build it with the API and the capabilities that you shouldn't be limited to what you're building. You should be able to be able to interconnect with other platforms automatically the value of your product just goes up uh, um, um, with so much more when those conversations are happening with companies trying to th see are you the right solution or not. But let's speak about leadership. Um, I'm, I'm very traditional, you know, or uh, business oriented, you know, we do our leaders forum, which is uh, uh, leadership, um, um, you know, s sessions for leaders and knowing to you to be able to build a culture, ha happy culture strategy of where they're going to be going with their business. And obviously everything that a, um, you know, a leader needs to know. Um, question is, how much is leadership different in a startup environment than a traditional business? Ooh, um, tough one. Um, we I said mean, we're going to do a tough question. <laughs> You're the expert at the, at the questions. Um, I, I mean, I think it's completely different in the sense that um, in a startup, what ends up happening is you do everything yourself. And therefore, it makes it really hard because you end up being hopefully getting pretty good at some of the things. And so it ends up becoming really, really difficult to um, to then... Um, 
to then, you know, move aside or to then uh, allocate some of those tasks to other people. And I think that that becomes a real big challenge at a startup. You know, you're used to doing so, wearing so many hats. Um, and so you, you definitely have a hard time in the beginning, for sure, you know, especially as your startup is scaling, um, hiring the right people, training them and allowing them to really succeed because you were so much in control in the beginning. It's, it's tough reducing some of that control that you had. Um, you know, even the beginning, you know, you were involved in marketing, all of a sudden you, you pass it off to someone else and, 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 and you, you know, you could probably do or you think you could do, right? That's where the ego comes in. You think you do a better job, but ultimately you got to let them fail. You got to let them succeed and fail. And I think that that becomes a really big challenge at a startup. You know, when you, in a big company, you already have those people. You have a very defined role in terms of what it is that you do, even if you are a leader. Whereas in a startup, you, there's no real defined role. You're you're touching every part of the business, and and that that is challenging. Mm -hmm. So so um, I for our listeners, just uh, you should know that I am monitoring the the chat for some questions, and I see some questions coming in. I'll get to some of those. Um, so if you do have a question, I want the engagement. I want to hear from you as well. It, if it's very related to what we spoke about or if it's something that you feel we are not covering, let's hear it and let's have that dialogue. Um, so I want to speak about leadership, and this is a, basically also um, trying to get in Isaac Wallman's question, which he, he's mentioning. Um, he knows um, uh, Menasha um, for, for a lot of years and has, has seen his success and monitored his success. Yes, it started with the passion. He was able to turn that passion into a business. Um, the question he's asking across the board, as you sp you're seeing in, in a meeting with a lot of those founders, um, we know that most of those founders come with some sort of passion. It starts off with that passion. You know, I have a passion to what I'm doing. I feel that this is the next big thing. I want to get involved. I want to get invested. Which point do you feel that you have the passion and the leadership in order to get it to where it needs to go? Which which point do you feel that it's a very passion-driven but there's the there's not the the typical we don't have the foundation in order to make this into a business or actually grow the business. Yeah, so I mean, I would say that in in, in Menasha's case, he obviously had a passion for gaming and was able to take that passion for gaming and turn it to business. In fact, I used to say that he he turned he 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 basically had a passion, um, you know, he had a passion for that gaming and then turned that into a passion for business. Right. And his business became almost like that game that he wanted to get to the next level and, and succeed. Um, mm -hmm. um, but I would say a lot of I think Mr. Wonderful, I just watched an incredible video. They asked him, like, how'd you make your first million? Um, mm -hmm. And he said, don't he said, tell me. His father um, gave him the first million. I'm sorry. Don't tell me. The no, father. no, his father did not give him his first million. He was working actually in an in a ice cream store um, uh, and he made it through video. Um, but. He said something that he, he said that entrepreneurship is freedom and people have a passion, not for the money necessarily, but for the freedom that it brings. And I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people here possibly have that, you know, that's their passion. It's not necessarily that they, you know, have a passion for, I don't know, I never had a passion for inventory management. I had a passion for helping 3PLs succeed. That was my passion. It wasn't like, oh my gosh, I love Units of measure. No, oh, that was the most boring thing in the world. Mm -hmm. But I was passionate about helping them succeed and building the product for them to succeed. So I don't think it's a passion necessarily. It has to be a passion like Menasha for the exact product that you're doing. I think passion and it can be for entrepreneurship. And that entrepreneurship could be to help whoever it is that you're helping actually succeed. Yeah, I was sitting in the sitting on interview um, and, and in my office. I love sharing this. This is my business card um, when I tentatively thought about opening an agency at 13 years old. I actually printed it in my home printer <laughs> with my parents' phone number and address. Uh, and the reason why I, I shared this is I didn't know where I'm going to go with this. I didn't know what I'm going to do with this and how it's going to be executed. But I just had that passion. Instead of playing games, you know, I was trying to create and create flyers and create letterheads and logos. Um, and eventually, I turned this into a business with Seattle de Shemaya. But the point, the point that I'm getting is that you got to be able to connect the dots. You got to be able to say, "This is my passion. This is how I see the business." And if you immediately see there is any missing links, you got to either fill the links or you know that it's not there's no business. 
I, I, just, I, I just reminded myself, uh, one of my earlier podcast interviews was with the famous Gina Wickman, which is the founder of the EOS platform and recently his Entrepreneurial Leap, which is a great book for people listening to this uh, um, conversation. Check it out. And he has five traits every entrepreneur needs to, uh, needs to actually identify and ask himself, do they have it? And and I think what uh, what the society is doing, you know, a little bit harm for the business community today's day and age is when you go on LinkedIn, you go to those conferences, and you hear these beautiful um, talks um, about you know about the different conversations, and people are saying, you know, you're good, just go on your own, follow your passion, follow your dream, and you know, create something amazingly. And people go, yes, I want to do it, and they go out and they start thinking. And it's a, you know, it's not a good, you know, in not entrepreneurship is not for everyone. And when I'm when I'm saying not, entrepreneurship is not for everyone, it's not for the chosen ones. Not everyone yeah. has that 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 resilience, so to speak. That I'm yeah. whatever it takes, I'm gonna do it regardless if I have to put. You know, people say I had to sleep in my dorm room. I had to, you know, start in my garage. I didn't have food for a month, and my wife almost told me take a job. You know, that struggle, most of those people, even if, you know, you don't have to go through this in order to be successful, you have to be able to have that commitment that whatever it takes, I'm going to do it. And not everybody's meant to be that. Um, so my message to everybody listening to this and saying, you know, I have this idea, maybe I pursue it or not. You always have to ask yourself, do you have what it takes, you know, in order to be that? And if you don't, even if you have that passion, ask yourself, should I partner up with someone and do it together? But that person brings it. Should I not do it at all? Um, I, I just want to take, I want to get your take on this if you agree or if you want to add anything on that. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think you, you hit it bang on when you said, you know, find a partner. Meaning I think that a lot of people, well, your passion could be for creating things, right? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily finance, for example, or, and therefore you just want to create, create, create. Um, or you're, again, you have a passion for fundraising or marketing, being out there. Okay. Then find a really good partner who will go down in, into, into the depths of the, of the, of the actual, um, product. And I think that, um, you know, it comes back to that, you know, uh, the discussion we're having earlier, which was, you know, it comes down to a lot of it, it you know, your passion could be amazing, but don't understand your own limitations, understand that. You need to surround yourself, whether it's a partner or advisors or whatever it is, or even, in, in, you know, employees, but surround yourself with the people, understand your deficient, your deficiencies, and then find the right people that can, that can, that can help out on those deficiencies. And a lot of times that's a partnership mm -hmm. where a lot of times it allows you to focus on that passion that you have. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you, yeah, but, but grow a successful business. So I, I completely agree with that. Yeah, it, it comes back to to what you hear so many times. People say, "I, I want full ownership. I want full control." Um, you rather control a hundred, um, you know, fifty percent of a hundred million dollar company than hundred percent and a one million dollar company. Um, so that's that's very important. And and you could also see it in larger companies, especially in the SaaS business. You know, I'm not sure what you're seeing, but the companies that I'm involved in, and in just in general uh, companies. Uh, that the company, the person that brought you sometimes to the first five million, will not bring you to the ten million, will not bring you to hundred million. It takes different skill sets. You know, when you're building your team, you know, your marketing guy that needs to get the company to public, you know, hundred million dollar company, is not the, the the same marketing guy that started up with company and got the first hundred clients. It needs a different vision, needs a different um, uh, you know thought process, it needs a different executional um, game plan. So sometimes those founders, that's where you see originally like the founder is the CEO and then they take a seat back and they say, I'm the founder and not the CEO. You know, you can see it even in companies like Google at different stages. They need or, you, different or you can find other companies where the C they let the CEO carry. They gave too much autonomy and, you know, the investors like we work. Um, yeah. And look what happened, right? Um, a combination of a multitude of factors that caused their their uh, yeah. not collapse, but obviously their their correction in terms of valuation. But mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. 
what is your take? Um, people are saying that this, you know, the VC world is throwing money, uh, you know, good money at bad ideas. People are just throwing money all over and taking a bet and saying, okay, I don't care about every venture, but one in seven will be successful, or one in ten will be some sort of successful. We'll see our return. Um, and sometimes that 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 blinds those those founders' eyes because they see money coming their way without really a clear plan how they're gonna build a company. What is he taking at? First of all, as a founder, when is, when should they go for public round funding? When do, should they st stay trying to bootstrap their company? Uh, I would love to get your take on that. It's a really good question um, because I've 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 had partners or seen people that have like you know not gone outside, um, not gone outside you know to find funding um, versus others that have raised you know phase one that have raised. I remember. You know, I know Rafi Stein's asking if we buy EG Elect -E stock, um, <laughs> um, the public public company I'm involved with. Um, yeah, yeah. I could say I could say we're moving we're we're moving pretty fast. I, I you know I'm not going to encourage anyone to buy to, you know to buy shares, but um but it's an incredible company, an incredible sector, and I think take going back to that company, we took money pretty early. Um, I think our first round was at three million dollars. Um, I think today we're worth over 100 million, but our first round was at three million and. Um, it diluted us pretty, you know, pretty tough. Um, so it, you know, it's tough to say looking back, should we have not taken the money? No, we needed it. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, should we have bootstrapped a little more, you know, you know, again, like you said, you know, if you own a tiny piece of a hundred million dollar business or a billion dollar business, it's the same as, you know, 50% of a half a million dollar business. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think that, uh, founders should, Try obviously lean startup. You know, make sure their burn is low. I think this, we're in an interesting time right now, um, where you know you look on Twitter and you look at the VCs and they're all like, "Yeah, we're still investing," but then you don't see a lot of deals, right? They're all like, mm -hmm. "Yeah, of course, we're still on it," and then they don't. You don't see so many deals happening. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. um, I think that there's been a massive correction over the past year in terms of startup valuation. Mm -hmm. um, I think exacerbated by the whole WeWork story and people and SoftBank like throwing piles of, of money at just any any massive startup. I think Woof was the other one, but there, there was a bunch of them where they threw tons of money at. So I, so I think there's been a correction in terms of valuations. I think overall, startups in general, we're entering, I think they say that the 2010s were all about like, you know, building your ping pong tables in your offices, growth at all costs, raise tons of capital. And I think that that's changed. The 2020s are going to be about lean, 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 get to profitability fast, don't worry about building ping pong tables in your office because you'll do better with a remote distributed workforce anyways. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's going to bode very well for VCs because companies are going to be focused on driving the value that they should be driving instead of creating massive stories around their company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which leads me to um, um, to another topic that I want to discuss, which is obviously very much in line with the topic of this session. Uh, we're just running a little bit uh, low on time, so we'll get to some some good questions um, uh, from the audience. If you have any questions, feel free to put them into the chat. So we'll get to those questions as well. But let's speak post COVID. Um, obviously, COVID um, came um, unexpectedly in times where business was thriving, the economy was thriving, um, business ventures, especially startups, were just on the on, you know, like you said, VC VC money was coming so fast on those startups and then everything came to a, a you know ultimately to halt and now people are starting back you know business is starting to resume but there are things that have changed for for a very long time i can't say forever but for a very long time um what are you seeing in the tech world um you know in the startup world that you would love to share with our audience yeah i mean i'm seeing in the tech world for sure but they were adopting this even prior to the rest of the world, but now it's just exacerbated, um, which is this, this remote workforce uh, situation, right? The, the, the death of the office, as they say it, right? Or the, they say the, um, you know, Silicon Valley is, is just over, right? It's done. I mean, think about it, right? You're a Silicon Valley based company and you can hire an engineer, right? You can pay him $150,000 or $200,000 in Silicon Valley. And he's not happy because he, he's throwing it all into housing. Mm -hmm. Or I can hire a guy out in North Carolina and pay him 125. Mm -hmm. Or I can go to Canada and pay that guy 125,000 Canadian 
or I can go to Romania or Ukraine and pay the guy fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars, right? Um, and and you're starting to see like left, right, and center, Square and Twitter mm-hmm. and Shopify and Slack announced yesterday that in the future, if you want to be remote, you can always be remote. And I think that that's a great opportunity for people, right? Mm-hmm. Especially people in New York area where typically hiring people, you know, hiring talented people cost a lot of money, right? Yeah. Or cost relative to hiring someone in Nebraska. And I think I think I think changing that as 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 startup founders or even just any any businesses, right? I'm, I'm, if you look on Twitter, like you see a lot of people who are just like, I'm I'm getting out of my lease. I'm just out of my office. Right, mm-hmm. left, right, and center. You see people. Yeah, you um, mentioned- that are reducing their their footprint. Yeah, you mentioned before, uh, Mr. Wonderful. I, I was on a call with him where he said that one of the things that he actually sent out a memo to all his inve- you know companies that he's invested that they need to cut overhead costs with twenty five percent in particular their their leases. So the goal needs to be that office space needs to come down with twenty five percent of uh, you know of overhead, um, which means that you know and <laughs> well, I think we are all like like I I our company Ptex is known for its culture. And with the award winning culture, should I say, you know, from, from best places to work um, and the different awards we got throughout the years. And I always was like, we got to have our Monday huddles. We got to have our, our different programs that we have in the office. Now that we are forced to do this uh, remotely with most of our people working remote, um, you know, productivity is, is an all time high. And, and even our culture, to a certain extent, we have our huddles through Zoom. We added some different uh, features to our huddle where we have guest uh, speakers from our team speak about different things they've done in their home. Once we had like a contest, everybody to show off their home office, you know, we're bringing people in, you know, we're making sure that the culture is not lost and collaboration is not lost with it, but we're making the best out of it. And I could say myself that a lot of my mindset has changed about working remotely versus working in the office when once upon a time it needed to be every day in the office nine you know full time so we could have that level of culture it's not going to be easy it's not easy to work remotely and and have everything under control but if you have responsible people people that are you know are very clear with their responsibility very clear with what they clarity what they need to deliver for the company and ultimately deliver it we anyhow went away from that nine to five, one hundred percent type of culture in our workforce. Um, there's something else I wanted to mention to you. I wanted to get your feedback. It's something that I wrote about in my Let's Talk Business articles that I email on a regular basis. Which, um, which is two things I saw. What I see um, is shifting. One, other than obviously cutting expenses, um, one is um, making sure that that actually not. To, uh, you know, the first is what you just mentioned, which is keeping a very t- a tighter grip on your overhead and t- keeping a tighter grip where the money is going. But number two, I feel is for business owners and particular uh, companies that are looking at technology, looking at customer service, looking at how they could actually improve their their uh, with efficiency and to deliver um, a great customer experience. I think people will not be happy with anything less than exceptional service. I feel that choices are there. People are much more lenient towards lowering pricing. And once upon a time, you said, okay, I need to buy this car in order to get great service. I need to go to this mechanic to get great service. But if I want to get a cheaper price, I have to compromise on my quality or my service. I think that will change a lot. People will, companies will have to work way harder in delivering that customer experience um, especially with, you know, if you're looking at products, look at e-commerce and how Amazon and Walmart, everybody's up in their game, how to deliver that same day service immediately with tracking in the next four hours, uh, whatever it is, and keeping you in the loop. Once upon a time, you ordered something and you were sitting at home waiting. Now, if you're not getting like the three or four types of communication where it is, oh, the company's not up to par with technology. Why am I not? Why, why don't they know which what, what hour it arrives? Or if it arrives, let me show me a picture. So I, I come into my lobby. I know exactly which bag to pick up. Um, and, and it goes across service providers as well with appointments. And now you see it in the medical field, how people are adapting to do, uh, you know, Zoom. Zoom Finally. Type of, what? Finally, customer service is coming to the medical field. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> you don't so, wait two I, hours in the waiting room. <laughs> yeah, I see it across the board. Um, I wanted to know, like, if you see that, how technology is playing a role with that as well. 
Yeah, I mean, again, you know, it's it's like remote workforce. You know, I think traditional businesses were hit like hit like with a with with a, with a rock with COVID. You know, you know, in terms of the downturn, all struggling. You know, in the beginning, it was just like shock. Then it was like, okay, let's plan. You know, and when they plan, they're like, okay, what technologies can I implement to a take my business more online? B streamline. You know, they're cutting costs. I went to the doctor's office. He's like, look, I had to fire half my half my staff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but I want to maintain. I said, well, how are you maintaining? He's like, well, I developed it. I adopted this technology and now you can check in online. You can change your schedule when you had three people at the front that was managing the schedules. And these technologies exist, right? Most of them are actually out there. So I think that, um, I think that changing, you know, adopting technology, we spoke about the beginning, right? You know, there's, there's the automation process, which I think is coming with a, with a, with a, with a force, you know, the, 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 the I, I think, you know, the, the doctor's offices where they had two secretaries sitting at the front answering calls all day are, are going to go by the wayside. Like that's going to end, right? You're going to check in on your phone. You're going to show up on your phone. You're going to pay on your phone, even though you're actually going into an office because it's all a contact less B it's more efficient. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that, you know, COVID and this downturn has exacerbated the massive uh, uh, um, 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 change or the, 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 the push to go digital. Um, and, and that's a great thing for businesses, uh, you know, mm-hmm. and I think that every service-based business, I don't care, healthcare, real estate, no matter what you are, you mm-hmm. know, you, you got to move fast with and innovate. Yeah. And to Shai's question about like how service providers could also come across, like they don't have that remote to workforce to work for them. But first of all, service providers do have some of which is back end office. Uh, I know um, from construction companies to architects to anybody in that service business are using remote or outsourced uh, companies, including ourselves. We have a call center in, in PTEX, one of our services. And all day long, we're picking up um, the phones for service providers. So you could just go from job to job and then you see your calendar, you know when to go, where to go, instead of people calling you or leaving a message and stuff like that. So to Shia's point is uh, it's not only about remote employees. It's about being more efficient, using technology to do a lot of the stuff that maybe you used to once upon a time call people to confirm an appointment. And now you have technology to do that or to update people on, on dues or credit card declines. There's so many different things you could do today with technology. The, the idea is to to you know i i always use it it's called ride the trains you know sometimes i do i have people you know or you know they we call it the spy shoppers you know those people that go in and buy from your store to see the experience um, do it for your company one way or the other do it for your company call in ask for a quote see the process and then say wait a minute you know it was three days and nobody even told me they got my they're working on my quote wait a minute, you can have technology, automatic, that person gets an email, I'm assigned to your quote, I'll be responding to it. You know, there's a dialogue. You do it for yourself, ride the trains. If you have a company, you have a business, even if it's a part of your business, have somebody do that experience and report back to you and see how you could improve. I bet you everybody could improve. And this leads us um, to a close of our conversation. It was so good. I, I didn't realize that we actually are one hour on the phone. I will end with my four Staple questions. Are you ready for four rapid fire questions? Go for it. A book that changed your life. Uh, ben Horowitz, Hard Thing About Hard Things. Number two, a piece of advice you got that you'll never forget. Follow Your Passion by Yossi Heber. Number three, anything you wish you could go back and do differently. Oh, too much to, to list here for sure. <laughs> and final question, number four, what's still on your bucket list to achieve? Um. I, I want to open an organization that helps people uh, that, that that helps people succeed in business. There you have it. Um, um, if, when you open that organization, make sure that I'm, I know <laughs> the information about it because there's a lot that we could share and actually help the community. You're getting involved in it, please. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So there you have it. Thank you so much for everybody that joined us. I know that this is just uh, now is 11 o'clock. This conference is going on till I think six or five. There's hours and hours of content, great speak, um, you know, speakers and people that are in the trenches. I always say there's something about getting an, uh, you know, an expert that could just advise you and, and give you advice. But there's so much more from from people that are actually in the trenches and doing stuff. Um, I'm going to um, if you um, if you click if you click on the people's tab, you can actually connect to Mayor 
and you could connect with him on LinkedIn as well. If you do want to connect with me, I'm also Many Hoffman, M-E-N-Y-H-O-F-F-M-A-N. If you do want to join my mailing list, it's ptexgroup.com slash join, where you get just free advice and my podcast as well as ptexgroup.com slash podcast. It was a blast. I had some fun. I hope you took some value. Mary, thank you so much for sharing some of your time with us. Awesome. Let's do this again. Absolutely. All the best.